All right, so one of the arguments I'll go back to time and time again, this may surprise you to hear, but I think have the most potential in the realm are the presuppositionalist arguments. Presupposition, you mean like Dark Dawkins beats up on Shannon? Yeah, those ones. <laughs> you know, how do you decide that? Yeah, those ones. Presuppositionalists have been getting a bad rap partially because of how they are practiced in this space. Matter of fact, they're, they're probably low man on the totem pole when it comes to arguments for God. They're probably the ones that have the worst reputation. Partially because of Darth, how he goes about it, just a series of questions where he tries to browbeat an atheist. Um, so I understand that. But there is hidden strength in these arguments. So let's take somebody, there are two times where I've seen them used really, really effectively in debates. They're the only two argument for God debates that I've ever thought got anywhere close to moving the ball forward, to putting points on the board. That's Jay Dyer and Tyler Vila. Both of the times they were against Matt Dillahunty. Now, Matt Dillahunty, to his credit, I think, shares some of the presuppositions of the presuppositionalists. That's why they were able to move the ball forward. So, one of the things that I think is almost inarguable, okay, about the presuppositionalist arguments, when you say, the, the way Dart Dawkins says it's kind of, borderline can be dismissed because they'll say, like, you know, God is the precondition of all knowledge. Well, obviously, to a certain degree, that's not true. You know, he's debating Shannon. She obviously knows some things. and <laughs> She's an atheist, and I'm pretty sure she knows things, and so does Matt Dillahunty. So God isn't belief in God, or God isn't necessarily the precondition of knowledge. But you can say that certain transcendent categories are the preconditions of intelligibility. Not only do I think that that's a true claim, I think that's an easily defensible claim, borderline irrefutable. So what did I say? I said some of the transcendent categories, if you go back to something like Kant, see Jay Dyer bases a lot of it on, uh, on Kant, which is a good starting point. And I think they go as far back as Aristotle, I, I'm not even, I don't even want to go down that road. But there are things known as the transcendent categories, generally laws of logic, mathematical axioms, things like that. Okay, now they are rules of inference. If you go back to Kant, I believe this was first introduced by Kant, but it might be sourced somewhere else. That's why I brought up the name. They are a priori basis for essentially empirical claims. They are the lens through which we can investigate reality. They are not empirical in nature. So in this transcendent category would be things like laws of logic, morals and values, mathematical axioms. Forget morals and values because that's a whole... That's a whole other can of worms in and of itself. Stick to laws of logic, because there are at least some that are absolutely case-closed true. So you say A equals A. Now, why they are not subject to empirical claims is because they do not exist in space and time. They're not actually an object in the world that you can investigate. You can't heed a law of logic and go, well, now this law of logic is 102 degrees, so let's write down what happens. Therefore, it is not available for empirical investigation. Empirical investigation implies something that's actually present, an object that you can study and, you know, heat it up and investigate it and take notes on it and yada, yada, yada. If I, if I heat this law of logic to 120 degrees, what happens? You can't do that. Why? Because it does not exist in space and time. Now, it's actually there, and it is the precondition of intelligibility. It is the basis on which we are able to form rational ideas about the world. This is why Matt Dillahunt agrees with a lot of this so far. If it's actually there, it's a rule of inference that we draw upon, okay? And here are some things that it's perfectly reasonable to infer about the laws of logic. One, they are transcendent, or we'll actually let's start one, they're inviolate. Inviolate means they cannot be other than thus. They are laws. That is why they work, they are, that is why they are rules of inference that we can draw upon because they're inviolate. They are laws of logic. So I say, so, and then point number two, they are transcendent. Transcendent is what I've already explained. They do not exist in space and time, which means they stand outside of time. So, I say something wildly brilliant, like A equals A. Wow, <laughs> really, Greg? Yeah, really, guys. 
A equals A, I promise. The mass is ending go in peace. Yeah, shut, shut down the argument real quickly. It is the law of logic, the law of identity. Okay. It does not exist in space and time. In other words, it is not time dependent. If I go back 100 years, 200 years ago, and it's 1858, and I'm hanging out with my pioneer brethren, and I say to them, by the way, guys, A equals A. They cannot answer me. Are you sure, Craig? This is a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, guys. It, why? It doesn't matter, guys. A equals A is a transcendent truth. It's not time dependent. Oh, okay. We're with you. We're with you. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So it is a law of logic. It is inviolate. It cannot be other than thus, and it is transcendent. It does not exist in space and time. If both those things are true, and I basically just pointed out that they're true, gave you clear examples of how they're true, then it is reasonable to infer. Uh, hold on a sec, little kitties. Little kitties interrupting the flow of conversation, doing something sweet and adorable. As per the usual, I don't know, she's like, what are you doing? Being the, being the sweetest thing on earth as per the normal. Hold on one sec. Okay, so now, getting back to the subject, if it is, if that, what I just said about the laws of logic hold true, and I'm pretty sure that that, I can make a really strong case that that was just basically true, okay, these are the tools, the lens, through which empirical investigation occurs. They are a priori, they are come about but by pure reason, and they are the lens through which we investigate all the claims of reality. Now, the argument, if you can't see how a transcendent category that I've already described as inviolate and transcendent isn't already getting us 75 to 80 percent of the way there towards something like a god, it's right at the doorstep. It's right at the doorstep. The argument contrary, okay, the strongest possible argument against this line of reasoning is what is called nominalism, or in the case of James, deflationary nominalism. It's basically arguing that the laws of logic, um, they have no spatial temporal location, right? Everybody understands that. They don't exist in time and space. And now what the argument for the presupposition is that they actually exist and they have preconditions of intelligibility. Almost nobody would doubt that they are the preconditions of intelligibility. They are a priori, a priori assumptions that need to be there in order for us to make investigations and investigate empirical claims to begin with. So almost nobody doubts that. What the nominalist doubts is that they exist at all. Now this is a really weird, uh, really complicated argument that I don't understand. And when I say I don't understand, I don't mean, I don't, you, see, I don't understand because you're such a dumb Christian. I mean, I don't understand because I do not think the argument is coherent. If the laws of logic are such that I just basically told you they are, and I'm almost positive that's true and provably so, demonstrably true and provably so. That's why Tyler Vila got so far in his argument with, with Matt Dillahunty. It's also why Jay Dyer did. They are both arguing a similar form of the presuppositional argument, kind of a high-level, high-brow, philosophical, abstraction-type argument. Both of them got close enough to the finish line. Neither of them quite proved God, but both of them got close enough to the finish line that Matt Dillahunty went and checked with the, with the big brain Alex Malpass. I uh, forget which one. might have been both debates, but he went and analyzed the debates with Alex Malpass, which is a way of checking his work, going, you know, I'm not sure if everything that I said in this debate holds true. So they got you really close to the finish line. Why? Because we are, if we are already acknowledging the reality of transcendent other, does that word sound familiar? Because that's what I use a lot in my videos. Transcendent other, ding, 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 ding. That is inviolate, cannot be other than thus, that, chain, that automatically answers a lot of these problems of evil arguments, doesn't it? If you think of God as God, not can, God cannot be other than thus, then there's only a couple of answers for these, you know, these profound problem of evil arguments. And the God of the Bible starts off with law. What everyone gets thrown with, law implies inviolate, cannot be anything other than thus. 
So we're already proving the existence of entities in the world that exist, called the laws of logic, called mathematical axioms, that are surprisingly similar in nature, in nature, substance, and form to God himself. They're immaterial. They have no spatial, temporal locality. They're inviolate. They cannot be other than thus. When people ask, why does God do X? The answer is because he can't do otherwise. God is, it is impossible for God to act. The one really big contradiction in the Bible, if you're one of these Bible contradiction <laughs> clowns, <laughs> just contradicts the small of the... The mustard seed is in the smallest seed in the world, Craig. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, you got me. Not a literalist. No, you didn't. Um, you don't understand, Craig. She eats mud and they force an abortion. Okay, don't care. There's weird parts of the Old Testament. <laughs> I readily acknowledge that. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Is it theologically sound, the idea that there is a God that is co whose nature corresponds by law to certain attributes, which means God cannot be other than thus. Settles a lot of those arguments philosophically if you think about it. Why? Because God can't act any other way. But then God doesn't have free will. Okay, fair enough. Maybe not. In a certain sense, maybe not. But God, if, God, if, the, if there are provable entities in the world that are inviolate, transcendent and cannot be other than thus then it's 75 to 80 percent of the way there towards that's you know it's not that far of a leap of the imagination to to postulate that there is an entity that is similar in in kind and form immaterial in substance to something like the laws of logic i mean atheists will probably hem and haul at that but it doesn't really matter. I'm just showing you why these arguments are good. No, I didn't get us over the finish line either. I'm just saying there's, there's a real, really, really good, strong argument buried in there that can be elucidated and worked upon and ferreted out and I think get us over the finish line. And when it does, you know, have your tides ready. I will collect them and that will be that. It would be really nice. It's really all I care about, guys. It's all I'm in for. So if you want to... I don't know, if you want to throw down about big, heady concepts, take your big brain somewhere else, all I'm interested in is your tides. Now, what was I going to say? Um, 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 I was going to go a little bit... Oh, okay, so the main argument contrary is called nominalism. And, as I've said, the T-Jump and James Fodor have both given at least lip service to the concept. James Fodor is the only one who's actually spelled it out for himself and labeled himself a nominalist and a deflationary one at that. Now, I don't understand the argument. I don't. And by understand, I don't mean I'm not smart enough to understand the argument. I don't think it's coherent. What he will literally argue for, and I've never heard him really spell it out, so, you know, I'll, I'll keep looking for this this steel man somewhere, but what he's literally, literally arguing for that a mathematical axiom or a law of logic doesn't actually exist at all. The reason why it has no spatial temporal locality, which he agrees to, is because it isn't actually in existence at all. Now, I don't get it. I don't get how anybody could even think that's true. So he starts to try and argue for it, says, we can make endless amounts of propositions, which I agree with, so you can say, when you're dealing with fiction, you can just keep saying things about Harry Potter, for example. That's the example used in one of these videos. I could keep making assertions about Harry Potter ad infinitum. I can say this, whatever I want. Okay, but in order for those pro propositions to correspond to reality, they have to be true. In order for us to call any of the propositions, even in fiction, see, fiction isn't just a scaffolding. It isn't just pretty tales we tell each other. That's the <laughs> fiction we tell each other about fiction. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Call me dumb, but I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> I did. I really thought that was funny. All right, so the fiction... <laughs> okay, wasn't that funny? All right, whatever. The fiction that we tell ourselves about fiction is that it's just pretty stories. Same thing that atheists are always saying about the Bible. It's just a book of fairy tales, pretty stories. There's no relevance to the real world whatsoever. A contraire. In order for fiction to count... There's a reason why, you know, I won't say Harry Potter because there's probably a lot of people who think Harry Potter is really great. Never read it, never bothered. Um, there's a reason why 
you know, Harold Robbins paperbacks are considered kind of a joke in the realm of fiction, and Dostoevsky is considered wildly important or must read, or you taught it at college at some point or another if you take literature. And that's because the story itself, everybody understands as an irrelevant scaffolding. Entertaining, it's what keeps you involved. But in the case of Harold Robbins, it's pointing you towards ideas. In the case of Harold Robbins, it's pointing you ideas that do not exist. It's just the scaffolding. So it's paperback, you read it, you're done in two hours, you throw it out, never think about it again. Were you entertained? That's the only question you ask yourself. Dostoevsky is a lot different. The fiction is irrelevant. This is why we start talking about metaphorical truths, spiritual truths, transcendent truths, symbolic truths. This is, this is my, one of my core things I always talk about with the Bible. Whether it is literally true word for word is pointless and irrelevant. Is, is it pointing to, quote-unquote, transcendent, spiritual, or symbolic truths? Ditto for fiction. Ditto for fiction. To me, the whole nominalist argument falls apart. Why? Because even fiction is only important if it is pointing to something transcendent to it. So if you're reading a book of... Di I've, I've heard atheists argue like, what's Dostoevsky got to say about philosophy? It's just fiction. It's just, that's so astonishingly ignorant statement. There would be no such thing as the existential school, school of philosophy, hello, without Dostoevsky. No such thing. There might even be no such thing as atheism. Promise. <laughs> I promise that's true. There is a character in Brothers Karamazov, and I always get which way. It's Alyosha I'm going to say, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's the other one. <laughs> I've made this mistake in the past. Who is, is a, is a, is a stand-in for the philosophical atheist circa 1880, whenever the book was written. And Dostoevsky gives him such a good, solid arguments for not God that there are people who think Dostoevsky himself might have been an atheist. But the point is, he gives a character an atheist, atheist leanings, and he gives them really strong steel man arguments about not God that are still fo floating around the atheist community to this day. Those ideas that, that constituted existentialism, perhaps atheism, were given epistemic existence by Dostoevsky himself. To say fiction is meaningless is ridiculous, is profoundly ignorant. What fiction at that high level is doing is wrestling with abstract ideas that are really, really, really hard to talk about straight on. That's why a lot of these philosophical debates devolve into like blah 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 because they're really really hard to talk about as you know an, a conversation they can start conversation it's really easy for that conversation to derail into abstractions and you start talking past each other so if you embody it with the story you put it in narrative form it's a lot easier to convey some of the core ideas that somebody like Dostoevsky is wrestling with and the only reason we hold the fiction of value and it's taught in literature class is because there are those transcendent ideas, philosophical abstractions being, being worked out in this telling of the story. The story itself is irrelevant. It's scaffolding. I pointed this out with Hamlet too. The only reason why we care about Hamlet for a speech like to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it's noble in the mind, suffer slings and arrows, outrageous fortune, take arms against the sea of trouble by opposing in them, to sleep, ah, that's the rub, perchance dream. The only reason we care about the, 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 the Hamlet isn't the story. The story is meaningless. It's a scaffolding. It is, the, the, for example, that to be or not to be famous soliloquy is about should I kill myself or not? And he basically makes a, an argument that we still talk about to this day. In that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffered off these mortal quarrels? What happens after you die? I'm really afraid to face death. That's exactly what that to be or to, not to be is about. After we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must truly give us pause. Ah, there's the respect that makes calamity of such long life. To sleep, perchance to dream. Ah, there's the rub. See, he's saying, what are these dreams that come after I die? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll live a little longer, because I don't want to know. I don't want to know. The reason why that soliloquy is justifiably famous is it gets at something transcendent that is readily available to every person, every culture under the sun. That's why we call it art and not 
Harold Robbins paperback and not irrelevant. So I don't get the nominalist argument at all, like understand it at all. I don't think it's coherent, I don't think it corresponds to reality, and I, and I, I don't see how it's a justification. Why I think the presuppositionalist arguments are strong is what I just said. No, they don't quite get you over the finish line, but they get you close. They are working out something with these transcendent categories that are provably there, and as far as I'm concerned, are the preconditions of intelligibility. So they are provably there, I think that's a fact. Well, okay, that's debatable. The nominalists will say they aren't there. But there are rules of inference that we draw upon. They have no spatial, temporal locality at all. They are just rules of inference. But there are certain things that it's reasonable to infer about them. They are transcendent and they are inviolate. Cannot be anything other than thus. There, we are basically already proving abstract entities that are really, 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 really close to the God of the Bible. Understood correctly. That's why I think there's ultimately a really strong core argument buried in there. Really strong one. Like really strong, you know. Get, we're, keep in mind, when we're talking about proof of God arguments... Okay, there's no reason for us to settle on a contingency argument that doesn't get you over the finish line. Keep working on the contingency argument. There are strong elements in it till it gets you over the finish line. That's when it's approved when it proves God. And no reasonable person will, every reasonable person will, will look at the argument and go, yes, that's correct. I don't know if I'm going to be a Christian still, but you did it. Congratulations, <laughs> you proved through logical deduction that God exists. I think it's an achievable goal. I really do. I really, I really honestly do. I think, I think it it's, could happen sooner rather than later. Why? Because some of these arguments are surprisingly close. You know? So, anyways. Uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. That's all I'll say in the subject for now. Yeah, it's a little rambly, but, you know, some really solid information in there. I think there's some really good stuff. Uh, I wouldn't I would write it off so easily if I were you. All right. So, anyways, there you have it, kids. That is all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.